Well, let's talk about all this with Lord Darrick. Kim Darrick is a former ambassador of the UK to the United States. He's also former national security advisor to the British Prime Minister. Uh, good afternoon to you, Kim. Hi, Julia. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, you've worked not only in Washington, but actually also in the Foreign Office uh, uh, here in the UK. Love to get your thoughts on, on, on what's happened uh, uh, over, over the other side of the Atlantic and here as well. Um, first of all, your reaction to, to Donald Trump returning to office, bearing in mind, of course, that you, of course, have been ambassador in part of his term in office and, and left in, you know, difficult, should we be honest, difficult circumstances after there was a concern, of course, that, you know, that, that not enough had been done by the British government to cosy up to Donald Trump ahead of yeah. his election first time round. Your description of my departure is unusually diplomatic for you, dear. <laughs> I um, try. Um, look, first of all, it's up to the American people who they elect. Second, the polls were, again, strikingly wrong. Mm -hmm. They were wrong in 2016, they were wrong in 2020, and they were wrong in 2024. I just wonder why they're just going to give up now, the American pollsters, or if they're going to somehow be able to work out why it is that they keep underestimating the Trump vote. Third, I think this turned out to be a change election. 60% um, of American voters said before the election that they thought the economy had been poor in the previous four years. Now, the calculation, I have a Republican friend who sent me across last night the calculations that are being done already on what happened. The calculation that seven out of ten of those voters voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. And that's kind of the election result in a nutshell. So we're, we're back to it's the economy stupid. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And as you have just said, incumbent governments are struggling everywhere because no one has been delivering. I mean, the American economy is in way better shape than the European economies, including our own. But nevertheless, it's not what the American people expected. Inflation was at 7% a couple of 18 months ago in America. And the government has been punished, as you know, a centre-right government was in the UK. So that's the reality, and that's the challenge for incumbent governments everywhere. Third, um, if you were about to ask me about, about David Lammy and all that, <laughs> look, I think this is all, to be honest, overstated, and I'll tell you why. Number one, uh, Trump's oppo is Keir Starmer, not David Lammy. David Lammy is some way down the food chain from that. So, you know, he shouldn't really care about this. Number two... You remember that Boris Johnson said some pretty extraordinary things about Trump when he was mayor of London and nevertheless had a very good relationship when he was prime minister. Because number three, what Trump cares about is power. Yeah. He will know that with this huge majority, it is likely, you know, highly probable, that Keir Starmer will be British prime minister for all of Trump's four years in office. And uh, they may get on well, they may... They may struggle, they may clash on things. But they're very so, different so, men, aren't they, personalities? Very wise. different personalities, but Trump recognises this is the guy he's going to have to deal with, and he doesn't, at the outset, want to have a big argument about you know, apologies or no apologies, anything like that. So I would move on from all that, and I think the, you know, there's plenty of substance out there where they may or may not agree, whether it's Ukraine or the threat to impose new tariffs on imports to America, or what's going on in the Middle East, or Trump's ambition to lead to, you know, reignite oil and gas exploration exploitation in the US yeah. and uh, leave the Paris climate change deal without bothering about uh, history. I mean, there's an awful lot in there, what you've had to say. But, um, there's so much talk about the special relationship, isn't there? You know, it's like, oh, you know, is there a bust of Churchill in the, you know, in the Oval Office and all of that stuff? Um, how significant is that relationship? And we know it's significant for us. They're the biggest economic and military yeah. power, being massively important to our security here in Europe um, uh, and a economically, you know, mass massive, massively uh, important as well. Um, but how significant are we to the Americans? Here's the thing. People tend to judge the state of the special relationship by the relationship between the White House and Number 10. And of course that's important, and it's had highs like Thatcher and Reagan, or Blair and Clinton, or Blair and Bush, and it's had lows, like, um, for example, uh, Richard Nixon and um, uh, Harold Wilson didn't, didn't get on. Oh, sorry, LBJ and Harold Wilson, which Nixon and Edward Heath, they didn't get on. Uh, certainly Clinton and John Major didn't get on because Clinton thought that Major had surreptitiously helped the, helped the Republicans in the, in the election that he won. So there's ups and downs there, but there is a foundation stone which is constant and durable. It's always strong and I think will continue to flourish whoever is in number 10 
or in the White House, and that's the defense, security, and intelligence relationship. That's got even closer in recent years. There's a huge amount going wrong in the world that it needs to address. So I'm pretty confident that that foundation stone will remain very strong. I mean, that's the thing. I, I wonder how much, again, you know, we talk about the relationship. It, it's sort of born of necessity often. It's security issues, it's military mm -hmm. issues. So, you know, again, we've, we've been a staunch ally and, and America of ours over the years on, on those key issues. We have a lot of the same national interests. Um, how significant, and you mentioned, you know, the politicians, leaders of our two countries who have not got on have, and have got on. How significant is that personal relationship? Or does it all fundamentally come down to you can have a nice chat on the phone, you can have a nice relationship or a, or a quite a distant relationship but fundamentally it's about national interest and that's what will decide these things yeah i mean obviously national interests predominate especially in the in the era of america first but here's where i draw a distinction there there have been times when the relationship has been so close thatcher reagan i can think of and blair bush during the afghanistan post post 9 11 when it's almost like the british prime minister is another figure around the US cabinet table. And when the American, American president is taking advice in real time and ringing up the prime minister and asking, what do you think about this? What should I do on this? It was also the case, strangely, although there's a big age difference between, uh, between Harold Millen and, uh, and J.F. Kennedy. Um, but that's quite rare. And most of the time, there is a sort of formality of summits and meetings yeah. and this kind of thing, an occasional phone call. But all the real business is done between officials uh, and between yeah. generals and national security experts. Well, in terms of your, your previous job as a national security advisor as well, uh, what are you expecting from Donald Trump when it comes to world affairs? We've talked a lot to, in, in the last 24 hours about the implications for Ukraine, uh, for, for Israel's security in the Middle East, relationship with China. Um, can you address some of those issues? Yeah, look, um, Trump is nothing if not unpredictable. So everything I say has to be a big health warning around it. On Ukraine, look, he, want, he says he wants to stop the war. Don't take seriously within 24 hours. That's obviously inconceivable. And then you have to worry a bit about what has sort of emerged, which hasn't really come from Trump, but it has come from J.D. Vance and people around him, that it's a matter of persuading the two sides to have a ceasefire, with creating a demilitarized zone between the two front lines in Ukraine, and then persuading them to sign some sort of peace treaty. And what they're very quiet on is, does that peace treaty allow Ukraine to get back its land? And does that peace treaty allow uh, Ukraine to join NATO and to join the European Union, if it chooses to, certainly to join NATO? And it's a bit quiet on that. And without that, then essentially a deal if forced on Zelensky would basically allow the Russians to say they've got a victory. If Ukraine is not able to join NATO, it's not able to recapture the territory that it's lost. Now, obviously, real politique comes into this, and you wonder whether Ukrainians at some point in future might settle for losing some land in exchange for being able to join NATO. But, you know, I mean, we all agree, I'm sure, that Russia shouldn't be allowed to profit from yeah. invading a neighbor in the way it's done. So you have to wonder just how this peace deal can be done. Without Trump on the scene, I would have said this Ukraine war is going to last for another you know, year, two years, who knows how long. And how much would that be welcomed by European leaders in terms of, you know, there actually there's a huge cost to this, not just in terms yeah, of inflationary absolutely. pressures, but also the cost of the military help. Would they actually secretly welcome um, you know, Trump forcing uh, Zelensky to the table? It's a good question, Julia, and um, look, I try my there best. Is, <laughs> there is war weariness. There's unquestionably war weariness in Europe. Um, we've spent something like 250 billion in the West supporting Ukraine. We can't kind of sustain that forever. There are seven million Ukrainian refugees outside Ukraine's borders in, in Western Europe and the US. Uh, so privately, a lot of European governments would like to see an end to this. But particularly if you look at the Central Europeans, people like the Polish government and, and others in that region, they're very worried that if, allow, if Russia gets a, a victory in effect and keeps you know, yeah. a large Ukraine and is able to dictate Ukraine's future alignment 
uh, and stop it aligning with the West, then the Putin will look further afield, whether the Baltic states or further that, to the West. That is the big because, because they the they have story. joined yeah, but they have now joined NATO. Well, some of the, the Nordic no. states, the um, Baltic states, already in NATO again. It's I can't imagine why all these countries want to join NATO. It's almost as if they uh, <laughs> see Vladimir Putin as a threat and then he complains about yeah. it. Uh, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your thoughts, Kim Derek, Lord Derek, former UK ambassador to the US.